Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. And uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind you where we left off in our last lecture. Israel was in a strait. Uh, here we've got Goliath, over nine feet tall. And he's challenging the people of Israel, the armies of Israel, to choose out a champion to fight him. There's no sense in all of us fighting. Uh, you choose out your champion and it's winner take all. If, if your champion's able to kill me, we'll serve the people of Israel. If I'm able to kill your champion, Israel serves the Philistines. Well, there wasn't any volunteers in Saul's army. Uh, little David, uh, 17 or 18 years old at the time, showed up and he heard Goliath uh, putting down the armies of Israel, uh, actually mocking the armies of Israel and mocking uh, the God of the armies of Israel. Well, Saul didn't have any other volunteers, so he got David and put his own armor on David. David was teetering back and forth. He couldn't hardly stand up under the weight of Saul's armor. He said, I can't fight with these. Uh, give me my staff and my sling. Uh, I've, I've practiced with them and I, I know I can take him. Well, uh, then uh, the Philistine showed up and saw David and said, what am I, a dog that you send this boy out here to fight me with a stick, a staff? And uh, he, said he cursed David in the name of his gods, which is Dagon and Baal. Uh, well, David said, you know, Goliath, you come to me with your sword and your spear and your shield, uh, but I can, that's where you put your confidence, but I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And Goliath said to David, I'm going to, come over here, boy. He said, I'm going to feed you to the birds of the, the fowls of the air and the beast of the field. David said, the Lord is going to deliver you, not only you, but your armies into my hand. And uh, I'm going to feed not only you, but your armies to the fowls of the air and the uh, beast of the field. No brag, just fact. David showing no signs of fear as he approaches the giant. And, you know, you can take a lesson from this as well. You know, things are going to get tough for God's elect. And there, but there's nothing for you to fear. As long as you have the gospel armor on uh, and God, the Holy Spirit, with you, there is nothing to fear. There are no giants in this world. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. We pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48, and it reads, And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose, that's Goliath, and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. No fear on the side of David. He, he totally trusts in the Lord. And, and I can just see Goliath and his backup soldiers, his army, are probably shocked that David is running toward them. Uh, they, they probably suspected that David would run from them. That's basically what the armies of Israel had been doing for the 40 days that Goliath had been taunting them. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. God in control. You remember, David picked up five of stones, five being grace in biblical numerics, and he didn't need five stones. It only took one for him to nail the giant in the forehead. 
And we see a beautiful type in this, I think, for the deadly wound to the one world political system. I'm speaking of Revelation uh, chapter 13. <clears throat> You've heard the, the old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I think we saw a good example of it when Goliath went down, verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and I'll add the Holy Spirit, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Now David had told Goliath, I'm going to take your head, and, but he had no sword is the reason this was, was stated in this, this way. What is David going to do? 51, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine. I can just see him running and jumping up on the chest of Goliath. And took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Uh, the deal was that if the champion of Israel won and, and was able to kill Goliath, they were to serve the armies of Israel. But uh, the armies of the Philistines saw their champion go down and they're hightailing it. They're taking the H-A route, verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, uh, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. Ekron and Gath, two of the major cities of the Philistines. In other words, they chased them all the way home. And you can believe that the, uh, the Philistines were slain as they were running, uh, leaving their carcasses for the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Chased them all the way home. Verse 53. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. They went after the spoils of war. The armies of Israel weren't in all that big of a hurry to go to fight the Philistines, but they're surely not uh, being slow about going to the spoils of war. What a great victory. And, and you know, think how this uh, made David look in front of the people who would eventually be serving him uh, as he is the future king of Israel. But uh, this was a, a giant step uh, by David in, in taking over the kingship. And remember, the spirit of God has left Saul, who is still king of Israel, and, but now the spirit of God is with David. Verse 54. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. In other words, David put uh, Goliath's armor at his home in Bethlehem. Now, Jerusalem at this time was not called Jerusalem. Uh, not until David and his armies defeated the Jebusites uh, some years later after this point in time did it become Jerusalem. Judah had taken uh, part of the area of Jerusalem west of Mount Moriah, but they had not taken the citadel, uh, which is where Zion is located basically, uh, from the Jebusites at this point in time. <clears throat> Verse 55, And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of his host, Abner was his main general of Saul, uh, Abner, whose son is this youth? Whose son is this youth? Question. And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Abner, of course, was Saul's uh, first cousin, uh, the very trusted uh, general. But he's saying, I, I, you know, I don't know who that, that young man is. But both of them could tell, but he was but a teenager. <clears throat> Verse 56. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. Now this word 
stripling is in the Hebrew is a, a limb, and it means something kept out of sight. Uh, and if you can visualize David standing behind Goliath, he indeed was a stripling because as, as huge as Goliath was, David would be kept out of sight. He, he was but a lad is what this is saying. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Israel has a new champion uh, in David. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite from Bethlehem. There's, there's another who would be born in Bethlehem uh, almost a thousand years after this period in time. Uh, Bethlehem means the house of bread, if you translate it, the bread of life. Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem uh, almost a thousand years after. Now, all the success on the part of David is for the reason that the Spirit of God is upon him. Uh, when the Spirit of God came upon one of the judges of Israel, Gideon, for example, three things occurred. Uh, most often, the courage was uh, given. And in other words, not just normal courage, but uh, courage to do something like David did in taking on the giant Goliath. The uh, second thing that the Spirit of God gave to one of the judges of Israel uh, was the ability to prophesy. Uh, we learn in Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament that David was indeed a prophet. The third thing that the Spirit of God brought to uh, one of the servants of God was wisdom. And David was behaving himself very wisely and, and very uh, efficiently as he went about fighting the Philistines. All this success uh, brings upon uh, Saul a spirit of jealousy. And we're going to see that in chapter 18. Let's go with it. Verse 1. And it came to pass when he, when David, had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul, as his own self is what this means. Now, this word, and a lot of people think, well, there was some kind of perverted relationship going on with David and Jonathan. That's not the case at all. Uh, they did love each other as a brother, but they don't, don't try and read anything into uh, in, in, or listen to anybody who says that they had some kind of perverted relationship. This word knit in the Hebrew is kashar, and it's a prime root that means to tie or to bind. And this friendship, uh, this bond that formed between Jonathan and David would be, would it even survive the death of Jonathan because David continued uh, to show favor to Jonathan's uh, family after Jonathan was dead. Uh, a lot of people think Jonathan and David were close to the same age at this time and they weren't. Uh, Jonathan at this time, the son of Saul, uh, in other words, he's the prince uh, of Israel. He's the one that most everyone is looking to as the heir apparent to Israel in that he is Saul's son. But Jonathan would be approximately 40 years old at this time and David uh, probably barely 20 at this time. <clears throat> Verse 2, And Saul took him that day and will let him go no more home to his father's house. Now this is not to be taken that he uh, forbade David from ever going to Bethlehem to his father's house because he, he made many journeys uh, at feast days to, to be with his family. This verse simply means that no longer would Saul permit David to go back uh, to uh, Jesse's house to tend the sheep. 
Uh, he, he wanted him uh, more permanently in uh, the capital uh, is what this means. Verse 3, then Jonathan and David made a covenant, uh, a contract or a compact uh, because, he, because he loved him as his own soul. And again, this would be a, a friendship that would uh, endure beyond even Jonathan's death. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And this was a, a custom of the time. And, and this would be a great honor uh, that Jonathan was bestowing upon David, uh, letting him have his clothing and his, even his weapons. And, and that's not all that unusual even today. If you have teenage daughters, you probably know that the, there's a lot of exchanging of outfits or clothes that goes on between uh, people of like size. Not a big deal. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, in other words, to battle with the Philistines, and be behaved himself wisely. He had common sense. And Saul set him over the men of war. David earned that position with his victory over the giant Goliath. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. David's uh, reputation was uh, increasing and many of these people that he is uh, winning over are people who will serve him when he becomes the king of Israel. And, but understand, some of these people are still serving Saul. So it kind of puts them in, in a difficult situation. In fact, is Saul's son Jonathan uh, on numerous occasions had difficulties because being David's friend uh, and being Saul's son uh, put, that's kind of the uh, wrong ends of the spectrum, if you will. And <clears throat> Jonathan found himself between a rock and a hard place because of his relationship with David on more than one occasion. Verse 6, And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, a great celebration of this victory to meet King Saul with tabrets and with joy and with instruments of music. Uh, Saul uh, about to be shot down. We're going to see that the women, well, let's go one more verse and we'll talk about it. Verse 7, And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Uh-oh, that's going to be trouble for David. The women are heaping praise upon David for killing tens of thousands of Philistines. David is becoming very popular with the people. Uh, he's winning them over left and right. Um, you, and he's probably more popular than Saul at this point in time. Kind of dangerous for a servant to be more popular than the king and the jealousy uh, begins to be stoked in King Saul. Verse 8, And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but, or only, thousands. And what can he say, what can he have more but the kingdom? What's next for this lad? who killed Goliath. He's gotten very popular with all of my servants. Uh, the women are praising him for killing tens of thousands of the Philistines, and they only praise me for killing thousands. Uh, what's next? Are, we gonna, are they going to want to give him the kingdom? <laughs> well, Saul may be thinking that in a jesting way, but that's already been decided. You see, Samuel has already anointed David king over Israel. Why? Because God rejected Saul for 
not following God's commands. And the Spirit of God has left Saul. The Spirit of God is on David. Verse 9, And Saul eyed, this means that, that he watched uh, with jealousy, David from the de that day and forward. The Spirit of God has left Saul. The Spirit of jealousy is upon him. And you know, jealousy can change people's behavior. Uh, someone who you would consider to be completely rational in, in all respects, if that old spirit of jealousy comes upon them, they start behaving differently. It's, it's an evil, evil spirit, the spirit of jealousy. And it's going to have a big impact on King Saul. Verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. In other words, God allowed this evil spirit. And he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand, as in the past when this evil spirit came upon Saul, David would play the harp, uh, music, and, and it would calm Saul. As at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Well, the music is not going to calm the evil spirit in Saul this time. And if you don't know what a javelin is, it's a spear is what we're talking about. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Now, uh, he, he was hoping to pin David to the wall with this spear. Now, scholars argue over what this he avoided out of his presence twice. Uh, some scholars means that there, that there were two attempts uh, that Saul made of throwing a javelin at David and striking the wall with it. Uh, I lean toward the opinion of those who scholars who think that that Saul lunged at David, uh, keeping the javelin or spear in his hands, and then David fled, and then he threw the spear trying to pin David to the wall. Uh, I guess it's kind of a mute point, but uh, there'll be someone else who will be Saul's target in the not-so-distant future with the javelin. That's his own son, Jonathan, verse 12. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him. This word uh, afraid is, could be mean uh, apprehensive. Because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. The reason for this whole situation, the Spirit of God had left Saul. The Spirit of God was with David. The Spirit of God, when God is with you, brings uh, success and glory. Verse 13. Therefore Saul removed him, removed David from him, and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. This uh, is a figure of speech, a Hebraism, and the went out and won in. It just means he went about his day-to-day -day activities before the people. And, and this, I think he removed uh, David from his immediate uh, presence so as to avoid uh, this uh, jealousy taking over and made him a captain over a thousand. That's, that's a pretty powerful military figure. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. God's uh, blessings bring success. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Now this word afraid is different than the word afraid we had in verse 12, where in the Hebrew it's yare, which means uh, to fear. It can mean to revere. It can also uh, mean to be apprehensive. This word afraid is nur, uh, and it means to shrink uh, from sore fear. Uh, Saul's rejection by God is being manifested in his fear uh, of David. Verse 16. But all Israel and Judah loved David, further driving 
uh, Saul into this madness because he went out and came in before them. He was a, a good leader. He was well respected by the people. He was courageous in, in battle. Uh, he was honorable, verse 17. And Saul said to David, Behold my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said to himself, Let not mine hand be upon him, referring to David, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Now, Saul did promise, uh, it was well known throughout the, the troops uh, of Israel, that Saul promised that he would give his wife or one of his daughters to whoever would fight and kill the uh, Goliath, the giant. And also his father's house would be free of taxes uh, from that day forward. So uh, is he being a nice guy here and, and meeting his promises? No. Uh, he has an ulterior motive. Uh, his motive is to, uh, I'm not going to kill David. I'm going to have the Philistines kill David. Uh, David's dead. My problems are solved. This is not an act of love uh, on the part of Saul. Much to the contrary. Verse 18. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? Question. And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? This is a very humble statement by David. Who am I that I should be the son-in-law to the king? And I'll tell you who he was. He was a man after God's own heart. He was not only suited, suitable to be the son-in-law to the king, he is the next king of Israel, verse 19. And it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel the Maholathite to wife. Now, nothing is written anywhere else in the Bible about this Adriel. And nothing is written about why Saul broke his promise to David that he was going to give Merab to him. Uh, perhaps the next verse explains. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. It was right in his eyes in the Hebrew. I think this can be explained in that, that Merab did not love David. She loved this Adriel. Uh, her father did not want to put her in a marriage that she did not love uh, the, the bridegroom. So uh, it, it was brought to his attention that his younger daughter, Michal, did love David, and that uh, served two, two purposes. 21. And Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him. Again, he's not being a nice guy. This is not uh, for David's benefit. He has an ulterior motive. And that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. And this means in the second way. Merab was the first way. Michal is the second way. Nice guy, Saul? No, he's, he's scheming to have David killed. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. Now he's Saul sending uh, messengers because he knows David probably doesn't trust anything that Saul says or does at this point. You know, there's a certain thing about forgiveness, but you don't forget someone trying to pin you to the wall with a javelin. David's not deceived by Saul's uh, words at all. And Saul's servant spake those words in the ears of David. 
And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. This is to Saul's messengers. And he's saying, you know, I don't have the dowry that it would take to secure the king's daughter. I'm a poor man and, and lightly esteemed. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. That Saul, this is what David said. David said, I can't come up with that kind of money for the dowry that would be expected for Michal. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. All I want, David, from you is the foreskins of a hundred Philistines. You see, the Philistines were uncircumcised. That's why they were often called uncircumcised heathens. And uh, you can be sure that these Philistines, a hundred of them, are not going to line up uh, to make a donation to David for the hundred foreskins that he needs to secure uh, the hand of Michal in marriage. He would have to kill uh, the 100 Philistines and Saul's thinking, surely the Philistines will kill David before he's able to kill 100 of them. 26, and when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. In the Hebrew, this is the days were not fulfilled. There was still time to uh, accomplish the agreement. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. He didn't stop at one hundred, he did two hundred. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full tale, that means a full count, to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. He kept his promise uh, this time, uh, although he had broken other promises. Verse 28, And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, much to his chagrin and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, God's protection over David, making uh, things difficult for his enemies, including Saul. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. The hatred of David was growing and growing. It's, it never will stop uh, until Saul is dead. Verse 30. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth uh, to battle, in other words, to war. And it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name uh, was much set by. This was in the Hebrew, is his name became precious uh, to the people. Uh, David means beloved, it can be translated. And the people did love David. He, he was, as I said earlier, he was very courageous. Uh, he was uh, fair. He was honest with the people. Uh, he was wise in his doings. And, and his popularity was growing. The popularity of Saul was surpassed by the popularity of David. Well, uh, David's going to spend a good part of his time over the next several years on the run from Saul and his armies. But again, God watches over David and protects him. It was promised that that seed line was going to come through David. Uh, that promise was made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God was talking to the serpent and Mother Eve. And he said, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed, as he was speaking to the serpent. And it, referring to the seed of the woman, uh, you will bruise his heel. Certainly they did that when they nailed him to the cross. Uh, but he, that's uh, Jesus Christ, will bruise your head. You see, Satan didn't want David to be on the throne. 
uh, Satan knew that it was through David's seed line, out of the root of Jesse, uh, would Messiah come. He knew that head bruising is not past, it's future. So Satan was doing all he could to keep that Messiah from coming. Messiah doesn't come, Satan wins. Uh, death wins. Well, Messiah came and death lost, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The reason Jesus was crucified on the cross was to defeat death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Don't miss the next lecture. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Talk to your Heavenly Father. You should make time each day to talk to Him and tell Him that you love Him. Thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon you. I really don't think you have a lot of competition from your brothers and sisters in this world today. Everyone's so busy running here, running there, trying to make a living. They don't have time for God. Uh, he has feelings just like we do, and uh, it hurts his feelings when you ignore him. Don't do that. Talk to your Heavenly Father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, financial difficulties, uh, marital problems, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. Father, watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, we have Derek, and Derek's from Tennessee. <clears throat> Do you think that God would still use us to fight a demon that was terrorizing someone if we had started sinning but knew all along God was with us. Well, number one, Derek, you don't fight with demons. You don't fight with Satan. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 4 how to handle Satan. And you rebuke him, and we do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17, 18. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have power over all of our enemies. That includes Satan. That includes evil spirits. But I'll tell you, if you start fighting with Satan and you think you can defeat Satan on your own without the name of Jesus Christ, you're in for a, a hurting. Uh, he, he, he'll eat your lunch, Satan will. You don't entertain evil spirits. You don't argue with them. You don't fight with them. You order them out in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's what we say in the name of Jesus Christ. Michelle in California, will you please explain what the meaning of the abomination of desolation in Matthew chapter 24 is? I sure can, uh, and that's Matthew 24, 15, for those of you who aren't familiar. And it states there, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet uh, stand in the holy place. Well, when I read that, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I want to know where did Daniel, the prophet Daniel, say that? And if you are a biblical, uh, uh, not a scholar, but if you're interested in, in God's Word, that's the way you learn God's Word. And it directs you to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, by the way, the Moffat Bible did a lot better job, James Moffat did a lot better job of translating pronouns, he, she, and it. And rather than translating where you, when you see the abomination of desolation stand where it ought not, Moffat correctly translates it, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not. And what this is talking about is when you see the Antichrist setting himself up in the holy place, claiming to be Jesus Christ, get out of Judea. Patricia in North Carolina. Is the Lord coming back soon to rapture the church out of here and those left behind are those with the mark of the beast? I see all these bad things happening and wonder if he will come back soon. Well, I look forward to the day that Jesus Christ comes back. But what you need to be aware of, Patricia and others, is the Antichrist comes before Jesus Christ. And contrary to what you stated, those who believe in the rapture theory, which is not biblical at all, are being set up to be deceived by the Antichrist. They're the ones who are going to receive the mark of the beast, not those who are left uh, here on earth after the supposed rapture. You see, Jesus is coming back to earth. Read Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, that's when Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives and the angels were standing there and they said to the disciples, uh, the others there, he said, you men of Jerusalem, what are you standing around looking about? Uh, he's coming back here to the Mount of Olives and uh, you know, what, what do you put the gospel armor on for? Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you put the gospel armor on to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. We're not flying away anywhere. Uh, Antichrist is going to be here first. We're going to stand against him, witness for Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit speaks through us, and then Jesus returns. I say, come, Lord Jesus comes. And I agree with you in one respect, Patricia, and that is things are a mess. I'll tell you what, we've got uh, things are turned upside down. People take what's right and say it's wrong. They take what's wrong and say it's right. Uh, only Jesus can straighten this mess out. Sheila in Georgia, where in the Bible can I find about financial blessings? Good question. Uh, Deuteron I like Deuteronomy 29 verse 9 where the instructions to Moses from our Heavenly Father, keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You want to prosper in all that you do? Well, keep the covenant. That means keep the commandments of God. Uh, and, and we all fall short. I don't want anybody getting off on a guilt trip. Uh, we all fall short, but that's what repentance is for. Um, I did a message not too awfully long ago called Prosperity, uh, it's CD 31555 and you might give that an order if you're interested. And you know, being rich doesn't always involve having a lot of money. There are many different ways to be rich, and it's much better to be rich in your Heavenly Father, uh, towards your Heavenly Father, than it's to have a gold mine uh, saved up because you can't take a gold mine with you when you die, but you need to build up your treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Uh, if another thing is on that, uh, be watching for your August newsletter 
which will be a, a Bible study entitled Rich Man. And that definitely tells you that there are more important ways to be rich than having a lot of money. Arlene in California, do you come from a long line of pastors in your family? No, actually uh, not. Neither of my grandfathers was a pastor. Uh, my father, Pastor Arnold Murray, was a very good pastor, as most of you know. Debbie in Michigan, I am interested in purchasing precious metals. I have done research on where to purchase them. <clears throat> However, there are so many different companies out there, I don't know who to trust. Can you please give me an idea of where to purchase so I don't get blindsided? Your help would be greatly appreciated. And no, Debbie, I'm not able to give you financial advice concerning or recommend a, a company, a reputable company from which to buy uh, precious metals. What I would suggest you do is check out uh, the, the customer references uh, for the companies that you're looking at. And of course, um, for those of you, well, why would you want to be buying precious metals? Well, the elect are not going to be able to buy and sell while Antichrist is here. Uh, if you want his funny money, uh, the, uh, the, the monetary system of the one world order, you're going to have to worship the Antichrist to get it. We're not going to worship the Antichrist. And therefore, it's good to have uh, precious metals to which you can barter. You're not going to be able to buy and sell, but you're going to be able to trade if you've got something that's valuable. Silver, uh, gold, other precious metals uh, always have been valuable. They always will be valuable. <clears throat> Martha from Tennessee. Can you tell me why Christians that believe in the rapture seem to prosper so much? Seems like everyone I know that is well-to-do believes in the rapture. Well, and we talked about this a minute ago, rich doesn't always necessarily mean having a, a lot of money. Uh, what I would suggest you do, Martha, though, is learn uh, the acrostic in Psalm 37. There is a hidden message in Psalm 37 that involves verse 7, verse 20, and verse 34. In the Hebrew language, now stick with me here, in the original languages, every verse is four lines in the original language. Verse 7, 20, and 34 are three lines which point them out specifically to the astute student. In verse 7, it says, fret not yourself in those who prosper in their way, in other words, the ways of the world. Don't, don't worry about people who seem like they get ahead. Verse 20, it states that the wicked shall perish and shall be as the fat of a lamb on an open spit. Have you ever seen a little piece of fat from a steak fall into the fire on a, on a, a broiler or a grill? Psst, it goes up in smoke forever. And then in verse 34, the last part of the acrostic, God will exalt the righteous, that means he'll promote the righteous, and you will witness the wicked being cut off. You'll, be, you'll witness the, uh, the wicked going into the lake of fire. Tony in Georgia, this is my question. 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Natural man is stated first after spiritual man. Does this mean that our souls were not in a spiritual body in the first earth age or before being born of woman. Well, no one was born of woman in the first earth age. So to answer your question, uh, Tony, there was no flesh in the first earth age because no one was born of woman. It was in this, the second earth and heaven age, that, that the womb was formed and people were born in the flesh. First earth age, spiritual only. Now that's not to say there was no flesh. There was no flesh man. But the dinosaurs, for example, were in the flesh in the first earth and heaven age. And who do we have? Elizabeth from Maine. Um, I thank our Father for the gift of this ministry and thank you. Uh, you are truly appreciated. Thank you for your kind comments. Let's get to your question. 
Uh, I am Elizabeth from Maine. So this has to do with Isaiah 66, verses 22 through 24. If there are no tears in heaven, then why do we have to look upon the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against God? I am so sadly troubled enough over people that do not know the Lord already because they are living in this wicked world without hope and nothing to look forward to. Why must we look upon those suffering because they rebelled? Uh, why must this be? Question. I will never be able to be joyful and happy then. Okay, well, uh, Isaiah 66, 22, 23, and 24 is talking about Gehenna, which is most often translated into the English language as hell. Now, Elizabeth, I want you to understand hell is the lake of fire. And if you go into the lake of fire, which Satan will and those who choose to follow him, you're blotted out. You're blotted out forever. It's not like we're going to be, uh, I, I agree with you, heaven to me would not be sitting there looking down uh, at old Uncle Jeff uh, screaming at the top of his lungs for the eternity because he's in the lake of fire. It's like the fat of that lamb when it hits the spit of the barbecue grill. It goes up and it's smoked forever and ever. But I want you to take a note, Elizabeth. You read Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. That's the kind of heaven you want. There's no more sorrow. There's no more crying. There's no more death. There's no more pain. And God wipes away the tears from his children's faces. That's what heaven is. It's not listening to people scream for the eternity because they're in the lake of fire. Cindy in Alabama, <clears throat> when our flesh bodies die, do we travel back to heaven on a space vehicle like Ezekiel described, or do we just step out of our flesh into a different time period? Let's call it a different dimension, parallel universe. Dimension, you said it. Uh, when John was taken to the third heaven age, that sounds like he was taken to the future. It was a future point in time, but it wasn't a third heaven. It was a third heaven age that he was taken to and then brought back to the second earth age. You, you, you got it. Since we came from heaven to earth at conception, then returned to heaven when we die, and everything that is has been and will be again. Everything happens exactly as it is written in the Bible uh, even thousands of years beforehand. Our dimensions like time travel. Well, I, I don't, wouldn't want to, I think you'd scare off a lot of people if you started talking about the dimensions being time travel. Uh, I don't think that, that your original question was do we travel in a vehicle such as is in Ezekiel chapter 1. I don't believe so. Uh, the flesh, our flesh body returns to the earth from which it came. The spirit returns to our heavenly Father from whence it came. Now, <clears throat> the reason I think that uh, the vehicles were in Ezekiel chapter 1 was because it wasn't just God who came to earth to communicate with Ezekiel. It was his throne, his entire throne. Patty from Georgia, <clears throat> Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21, tells of Christ riding out of heaven on a white horse. Is this literal or symbolic? Does Jesus really arrive on a white horse uh, at the second advent? Yes, but be very careful. You see, there is another who will arrive on a white war horse. You can read about him in Revelation uh, chapter 6, verse 2. He even has a bow, like the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ around. <clears throat> the, the problem is, though, his bow in the Greek language is toxon, and it means a cheap fabric imitation. That's the Antichrist. He returns first. Uh, as always, he's going to imitate Jesus every way he can. Lucifer means the morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus Christ is the morning star. So Jesus returns on a white horse. Guess what? Satan's going to return on a white horse. Why? He wants to deceive you into believing that he is Jesus Christ. 
don't be deceived. Patty from Georgia, we did that one. Okay, who have we got now? John from Kentucky. I'm sure what you do is a labor of love, not wanting to contradict you or offend. I was just wondering why you don't teach more on the New Testament more often than what uh, little you do. And that's addressed to me personally because we teach uh, the pastors of Shepherd's Chapel teach every book in the Bible. So we found ourselves in a bit of a quandary concerning my teaching in the New Testament. And you're not watching the Sunday messages very much because I teach the New Testament as much as I teach the Old Testament in the sun, regular Sunday messages. But we've got, found ourselves in a bit of a quandary as far as me breaking into the New Testament with teaching. Why? Because if I teach a book in the New Testament, we're going to pull Pastor Arnold Murray's teaching of the New Testament. And I'm not ready to quite do that at this point in time. We get too much mail from people thanking us uh, for continuing to air Pastor Arnold Murray's teachings. Pam from New York, one question. Is there any one way to tell 100% for sure if you're one of God's elect? Or is it something you will only find out when the time comes? If you understand God's overall plan and you understand that the Antichrist comes first, uh, you're probably one of God's elect. There aren't very many people that understand those two things at this point in time. I am out of time. I want you to know that I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you do enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what? It makes your Father's Day when He looks down from heaven and He sees you with the letter that He wrote to you, the Bible, seeking knowledge of Him. It makes His day. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Uh, you know, everything is, is super duper here at the chapel. I do want you to know there's one thing that's most important, though. We stay in His Word every day, and His Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.